Welcome to Sand City Sports. I am your host, the Cape Cod Kid, artist formerly known as Andre King, and we're back again to bring you all the sports and current events news stories that you need to know. Let's get it started. After a month of competition in the NBA this season, a couple things have changed up and a couple things have stayed the same. You're aware of those things that have stayed the same. The Golden State Warriors have the best record in the West at 10-2, and, and Chef Curry leads the NBA in scoring at 29.5 points a game. The Portland Trailblazers are once again a number three seed, led by Damian Lillard and C.J. McClellan, assisted by solid rotation players, a youthful bench, and veteran coaching staff. The Boston Celtics, led by Kyrie Irving, Gordon Hayward, Jason Tatum, and Al Horford, are a top team in the East. And the Philadelphia 76ers, led by Joel Embiid and Ben Simmons, are closely trailing the Celtics for Eastern Conference supremacy. But you didn't know the Houston Rockets were going to be two games under 500 after their first 10 games, and the Washington Wizards would have amassed only two wins in this same time frame. You didn't know the Toronto Raptors would be 11-1 after their first 12 games, beating the Boston Celtics, beating the Philadelphia 76ers, beating the LA Lakers and the Utah Jazz, with a first-time head coach and a reluctant superstar. But you didn't know the Charlotte Hornets would be solidly in the playoff hunt as a number six overall seed led by Kemba Walker, who is second in the NBA in scoring at 28.1 points per game. Or the Detroit Pistons were close behind them at 5-5, five and five, and even though they were an overall 8th seed, they were only two games behind the 4th seed at Philadelphia 76ers, led by Blake Griffin, who was 5th overall in the NBA in scoring at 27.3 points per game, and Andre Drummond, who leads the league in rebounds with almost 17 takedowns a game. No, you didn't know that or that the Denver Nuggets would be the number two overall seed in the Western Conference, led by a dynamic young core of Jamal Murray, Nikolai Jokic, Gary Harris, and also Will Barton and Paul Millsap. No, we didn't know any of these things. And last but not least, we didn't realize that a team from Northern California would be in the playoffs after one month of NBA competition, and a team from Southern California would be on the outside looking in. Folks, right now we have a strong competitive balance in the NBA. And those of you who believe that the championship is destined to return to the Bay Area, I'd only ask if you happen to tune in for the late game on the NBA on TNT two days ago. Case in point, the NBA championship is up for grabs this season, which is a beautiful thing. And no, it's not a one-horse race. There's about five teams in the association that could be bringing home the Larry O'Brien trophy, which is just outstanding. That said, we've looked at the big picture view, and now the Cape Cod Kid has to get into some specifics. I'm willing to part ways with the 70 wins. I'll take a few hits on some side bets. But beyond this, I have a couple fundamental issues with the Celtics. The Celtics have eight players playing over 20 minutes a game, which is far too much, and their top players only playing just over 30 minutes a game, which is far too little. Look, folks, you've probably realized that basketball is not hockey. You don't play five or six minutes and then sit for eight to 10 minutes and then get up and play another five or six minutes. That's not how it works. If you are a star, in the NBA, or an all-star above that, or an MVP candidate above that, you need to be playing 35 minutes minimum every single night. Now, if you're going to counter that with, oh, look at the Golden State Warriors. None of their big four play over 35 minutes a game. Clay, Steph, and Durant play just under 35, and Draymond plays just under 30 minutes a game. Then I'm going to come right back at you and say that's because the Golden State Warriors are blowing teams out on a regular basis, which in their minds necessitates that their star players sit the entire fourth quarter, even when they're having 
undisputedly historic evenings. So to be clear, all of Golden State's Big Four, Steph Clay, Draymond, and KD, all of whom are perennial all-stars and all of whom are consistent participants in the Team USA basketball program, meaning they're hooping 24-7, 365 and a quarter. All of them play big minutes in competitive games. All of their games might not be competitive, but when the Golden State Warriors are playing the upper echelon Western Conference teams, their big four are out there on the court for the majority of the game. Back to the Boston Celtics and Brad Stevens. This YMCA equal playing time for everyone substitution pattern that you've got going on is unacceptable. To be clear, I think Brad Stevens is a top three coach in the NBA, bar none. Nonetheless, I think his starters need to play more, most notably Jason Tatum. Look, if Kyrie and Gordon Hayward need to be on minutes restrictions, i.e. San Antonio Spurs and their policies, that's fine. But there's no reason that Jason Tatum shouldn't be playing about 35 minutes in a game. Look, the fact of the matter is stars play, most notably LeBron James, who is 11th in the NBA in minutes but Anthony Davis, DeMar DeRozan, Blake Griffin, Devin Booker, James Harden, LaMarcus Aldridge, Jimmy Butler. You have to play your star. Yes, yeah, some of these guys have had injuries, but not season-ending injuries, let's be clear on that. And they were ready to go come playoff time, come money time, um, and balled out when the brightest of bright lights were on. A few other quick hits around the association. Have to tip my cap to Toronto Raptors head coach Nick Nurse. First time as an NBA coach, the Raptors are off to an 11-1 start. This is a dynamically different team than he was an assistant coach on last year. And he has these guys playing at the highest level in the entire NBA. Not far removed, the Milwaukee Bucks are second in the Eastern Conference with a record of 9-2. Led, of course, by Giannis and Tatakumpos, but also Coach Bud, coming from the Popovich coaching tree, has this team that lost in the first round last year playing at an elite level, manifest by the 20-piece with special sauce that they handed out to the Golden State Warriors on Thursday night. Next up, the Indiana Pacers, led by Victor Oladipo and DeMontis Sabonis, our number five seed in the East at 7-5, and five, tied with the Philadelphia 76ers and only one game back of the Boston Celtics. Both these young men are playing on par with the elite players at their positions league-wide. And finally, after a rocky start and handful of close losses, the Los Angeles Lakers acquired a player with energy and championship pedigree in Tyson Chandler who could provide the defense, rebounding, and toughness needed to help restore this storied franchise back to contention. Also in the world of hoops, have to discuss what's going on in the WNBA right now, as the players have decided to opt out of their collective bargaining agreement with the league. Now to begin with, I have to say that if you consider yourself to be a true fan of the game of basketball, and somehow you're not a fan of the WNBA, then I don't consider you to be a true basketball fan, point blank, period. Never mind the fact that the best basketball players on the planet support women's hoop. The fact of the matter is, all of the dynamism, innovation, creativity, and savvy that we see in the NBA game is also on display in the WNBA game, which just happens to be played below the rim for the most part. That established, I think it's important for the basketball community to take note that the WNBA and their players union are working out a new collective bargaining agreement. Because you and I both know that it's unacceptable that Brianna Stewart, who was not only a 2018 WNBA champion, 2018 finals MVP, league MVP, two-time All-Star, and oh, by the way, four-time national champion and three-time consensus national player of the year. 
Yeah, that young lady made about $58,000 last year with all those championships and most valuable, you heard what I said. To be clear, both Adam Silver and David Stern have shown great vision, leadership, and perseverance for over two decades as relates to women's basketball. And in my view, charter flights have very little to do with the current sustainability and future advancement of the WNBA. There are certainly a number of things to be worked out. All parties have been very attentive to these issues over the league's 22-year career. But we as basketball fans need to watch the NBA draft. We need to watch Summer League. We need to pay attention to free agency. And we also need to tune in to the WNBA during the summer months for the good of the game of basketball and all of its participants. So ladies and gentlemen, a college basketball game was played on Tuesday and it was kind of a big deal. As the number two Kentucky Wildcats matched up against the number four Duke Blue Devils in the Champions Classic, the story of the night beyond the tradition, championships, and leadership of both storied programs was the sheer spectacle of athleticism put on by the players on the court. This game saw both teams score the same amount of points in both halves for a final score of 118 to 84. And by now it's quite clear that we can thank R.J. Barrett, Zion Williamson, and Cam Reddish for that result. This game made statements on many levels, but above all, this contest was about what college basketball should look like instead of what its leadership is making it look like. We know that this game included John Calipari, an NCAA championship coach who for up to a decade dominated the one and done market, becoming the only coach in college basketball history to have a number one overall and number two overall draft pick in the same recruiting class. And of course, this game also included Coach Mike Krzyzewski, who has won five NCAA tournaments and is now the only coach in college basketball history to have the number one overall, number two overall, and number three overall recruits play for his program. You might have heard of them. So folks, the players performed, the fans were happy, the NBA executives were happy, the ESPN executives were happy, and we weren't focused on $100,000 here or $200,000 there that an elite prospect may have received. In a world where one coach from Kentucky makes upwards of $8 million per season, and another coach from North Carolina makes upwards of $9 million per season. No, in a multi-billion dollar industry whose consumer confidence seems to grow year in and year out, we weren't focused, and the NCAA shouldn't be focused, on fractions of 1% of the overall revenue possibly going to players or their families, or denying the transfer rights of a student athlete whose rationale is beyond any reasonable doubt. You, me, and everybody else was focused on a good ball game on Tuesday. And that's what the NCAA needs to focus exceedingly more of its attention on going forward. After the first game of the second half of the NFL season, you wouldn't believe it if I told you that the New England Patriots, Pittsburgh Steelers, Houston Texans, and Kansas City Chiefs are all atop their divisions in the AFC. Hard to believe, never mind the fact that the New Orleans Saints, Los Angeles Rams, Chicago Bears, and Washington Redskins are all atop their divisions in the NFC. After a 1-2 start in New England, a star running back holdout in Pittsburgh, an early, early season acquisition in Chicago, 
and the acquisition of a new offensive coordinator in Carolina. Two AFC teams are exactly where you thought they'd be, and two NFC teams have surprised a number of people and justified their bold actions. No doubt the NFL, true to its scheduling formula and history, once again has a situation where there are five teams in each conference who have a legitimate shot at taking home the Lombardi Trophy. In conclusion, this is Sand City Sports, and we are coming at you from a sunny peninsula in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And therefore, I'd be remiss, even though I'm quite a bit late on this story, if I didn't recognize the 2018 World Series champion, Boston Red Sox. Folks, they say wisdom comes suddenly, and this championship team appeared suddenly, achieving things that, frankly, it is going to take quite some time to fully deconstruct. They won 119 games total, 108 during the regular season, a mark that only the 1998 Yankees with 125 wins have surpassed. They beat two 100-win teams in the divisional and conference championships in five-game gentlemen sweeps. And since they appear to be gentlemen, they did the same thing to the defending National League champion LA Dodgers in the World Series. Yes, this Red Sox team was special, and here in the Cape, we know that at least a small component of their special sauce comes from some of the home cooking that we have here in this neck of the woods. As I have to give a special shout out to the boys at Pizza One Subs Two, who were in the building in SoCal for that Game 5 victory, and no doubt provided some of that needed motivation that helped get those boys right over the top. Shout out to the 2018 World Series champion, Boston Red Sox. Ladies and gentlemen, that's going to do it. Go ahead and comment, like, and subscribe as you feel the need. I am your host, the Cape Cod Kid, artist formerly known as Andre King. We want to thank you for tuning in to Sand City Sports, and we will see you back again the next time. Today ourselves Just in the Mars pain we feel Yes, sometimes we do hate ourselves But each day we try to retake ourselves So yes, we peace of souls do sedate ourselves Just in the Mars pain we feel Yes, sometimes we do hate ourselves But each day we try to embrace ourselves Yeah